Welcome back to Talking Business. I'm Karishma Vaswani in Singapore. Now, one firm that's tracked the city-state's journey from backwater to bustling financial center is the DBS Group, a Singapore lender that's grown to become Southeast Asia's biggest bank. DBS Chief Executive Piyush Gupta gave me his thoughts on the future. What Singapore stands for, in interesting ways, DBS also stands for. So Singapore is an entreport which brilliantly captures South Asia, Southeast Asia, and North Asia for commodity flows, for trade flows, for capital flows. Well, that's exactly what DBS does. And frankly, as you think about the way forward, uh, Singapore has a new agenda. It needs to re-innovate, reinvent itself for the next 20, 30, 50 years. And frankly, that is exactly what DBS needs to do. Singapore has managed to maintain its position in the region because of some of the things that we've discussed, incorruptibility, ease of doing business, and DBS has benefited from that. But in the future, it's very likely that countries in the region will catch up. They're playing catch up now, and they will catch up. How do companies like DBS get ahead and stay ahead in this market? Well, you know, if you think about Singapore in the 60s, the strategy was very simple how to create a first world infrastructure in a third world region, both hard and soft infrastructure. I believe today Singapore has exactly the same opportunity. How to create the world's first future city in an analog world. So if we can be the first truly digital city, which can leverage all of the stuff I'm talking about, technology, data, information, sensors, we will be 20 years ahead of anybody else. And I can tell you it will still take the rest of the world 25 years to catch up. If you could look into your crystal ball and project what kind of place Singapore needs to be in the next 50 years, at 100 years old, to stay relevant, what would you say? As a city-state, it is a test plan for so many things. It's got the technology, it's got the resources, it's got the fiscal uh, capacities, and right now it has got the intent. So the ability to create the world's first wired up, digitized future city can keep Singapore going for the next 25 years. So as you've just heard, the head of Singapore's DBS group believes that becoming a digital nation is key for Singapore. But some argue that there are more structural issues that the country needs to undertake, including a rethink of its education system and opening up of civil liberties. We're newly joined by Nolene Hazer, a Singaporean social scientist who recently served as the Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Simon Long of The Economist magazine is still with us. And Kelvin Teo, a young tech entrepreneur. So, Nolene, I'm going to start with you. You know, your experience as a social scientist here in Singapore, when you look at the ambitions of this country to turn itself into this digital nation, smart nation, they call it, is that realistic, given the fact that the education system is often criticized for being far too rigid? Singapore started off as an unlikely country and is on its journey to become a smart nation. Hmm? But there are many things uh, that uh, have been laid out to make that journey possible. And it is a, a lot more uh, uh, a country that has addressed um, dealing with, at that time, the poverty issues, and now increasingly looking at the inequality issues. At one stage, at the time when I was growing up, meritocracy was a major driver um, of the new nation. The solutions are there, but it cannot just be um, a technological solution. Right. So moving towards a smart nation is not just about technology, it's about people. It's being, really be having smart people. You know, you have benefited from the education system in Singapore, and you have as well, Kelvin. You grew up in Malaysia, but you came here when you were 15 years old and went through the Singapore education system. Now you're a technology entrepreneur in the very industry that this country is trying to develop. What would you say to the criticism that perhaps Singaporeans are often too rigid in their thinking? I think that Singaporeans, or rather Singapore in general, I think we have very good hardware in terms of very, having very good training, technical trainings. So there's no shortage in terms of talents and expertise, in terms of technology, in terms of finance, in other math and sciences. But having um, spent a bit of time in, in US, such as at the top universities like Harvard, what I do find is that from a technical, technical perspective, a lot of Singaporeans or even Asians in general are very good in it, and perhaps even better than some of our Western counterparts. But what is perhaps lacking is the sense of conviction in terms of pursuing some of the, of the careers or the opportunities they may have not have not been trapped and tested in Singapore. And I think what we're seeing is a gradual change, a transition, whereby the first wave of um, Singaporean entrepreneurs have 
these pioneers have successfully blazed the, the trail in terms of showing that Singaporeans can actually start really good tech startups and have reaped the rewards of it. And the second generation of entrepreneurs are gradually rising up to, to that occasion. I think that mindset's going to change. I mean, it sounds like it has to change because it, it's in line with what the government's trying to do to turn this place into more of a you know, digital city. I, I suppose it will change as you get more and more examples of successful local startups, of which there, there are, to be honest, not that many at the moment. But when people see their uh, peers or just slightly older people making, making fortunes very quickly, then presumably the others will, will seek to emulate them. Nolene, from your conversations with uh, people here in Singapore, do you get a sense that there is the political will that, that, that they actually recognize the need that for their ambitions to be realized, they've got to move in this direction. I, I think so. I, if you listen to some of the speeches uh, of the leaders and also the, the different discussions, it's not like in innovation is not happening here. But the, the, the main core is, is actually making sure that the country as a whole, that people, especially the young people, feel that they are stakeholders to a future. And to in order to be a stakeholder uh, and help to be co-creators uh, of the country's uh, next journey, if you like, you have to engage um, and, and you have to have genuine partnership and genuine uh, respect as, uh, for, for ideas, some of which may be, and including lifestyles, may be actually not what what you want. As we cast uh, our eyes forward up to the next 50 years and we look at what Singapore might look like when it's 100 years old, I'll, I'll start with you, Kelvin, as, as the youngest person on the panel. What, what do you think the sort of uh, technological shape of Singapore will be at that point? SMEs are seeing that growing or, uh, domestically, organically in Singapore is no longer sufficient for them to, to sustain their growth and therefore they're kind of forced to venture out into Southeast Asia or even into the regional markets. And given that SMEs in Singapore account for appro approximately 99% of enterprises, half of the GDP or even 66% of the employments, I think the change of attitude of SMEs towards adoption of technology will be critical in terms of driving the economy forward and subsequently shaping the nation in 50 to 100 years time. Yeah have a demographic challenge, which is the aging society with a declining uh, birth rate. Uh, I would uh, like to see a greater uh, development of the care infrastructure and uh, greater investment uh, using the, um, the net investment returns from the National Reserve to build a city with a beating heart. A city with a beating heart. Simon, what about you? I think that will come, or that Singapore will move in that direction, that as, as Nodin says, they have the resources and they can afford to be more generous in looking after uh, uh, young mothers, as we, we spoke earlier, but also the increasing numbers of elderly. My, my worry would be that uh, it, this, it current trends continue and you see uh, a, a society which is no longer one which is broadly harmonious and meritocratic, but one in which uh, Things are very good for the young, well-educated, who have lots of opportunities. Uh, not so good for a lot of less educated Singaporeans who find themselves without enough cash, particularly when they uh, reach retirement age. And still pretty grim, frankly, for large numbers of migrant laborers mm -hmm. doing uh, low-paid jobs. Absolutely. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us in this discussion. It's been a fascinating discussion with all of you. Thank you, Nolene, Kelvin, and Simon. Well, this is the last program in this series of Talking Business. We'll be back on BBC World News on the 11th of September with a special program from the World Economic Forum in Dalian, China.